Amen to that. Yes, indeed. So, so thankful uh, for Rick leading us in those songs and for you singing out uh, so capably this morning. It is a delight to be together for the sake of worshiping our God and Father in heaven. We're thankful for each and every one of you who's here this morning. If you're a guest, uh, please know that it honors us that you're here uh, with us this morning. We will be in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We'll be there in chapter 5 in just a moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 12. We'll get there shortly. We do ask that you be back tonight at 5. We look forward to singing together. We'll sing songs that emphasize peace, as Rick's already so capably done this morning in singing some of those songs, and we'll sing songs about peace tonight. Gentlemen, if you'd like to pick out songs along those lines, we'd love to have you lead those. And we will close by singing a few songs out in the foyer. If you've not been here the past few months for singing night, uh, what a treat it is to have those acoustics and uh, join together and looking at and being with one another as we close out in song. So be sure that you're here tonight at 5 for singing night. Also, Rick mentioned this, but we do covet your prayers, especially as the heat kicks up at the end of the week. We look forward to being together for camp uh, beginning this afternoon, Clark Sims week, Brian Evans week. And if you'd like to come visit, we worship every night at 640. Great time for you to, to, to be a part of a great singing and a great lesson. And so we'd love to see you down there for that. I would recommend probably getting there quite a bit before 640. Just Wednesday and Thursday night especially are going to be a little more packed. And so maybe the earlier the better you can get a, a good seat. But uh, it'll be a great, great night all of those nights. We want you here Tuesday night, but we'd love to see you at camp the other nights. And I'll just throw this in here to be praying for Clark. Uh, this is his 20th session to direct and it's already started off in a memorable way as his oldest son Kelly and his wife Megan Kelly's a youth minister at Midway uh, they are over at the hospital now ha expecting to have their son born today uh, any minute and so Clark will be out of pocket today at least and um, but we'll have a great great time and what a way to start off a week with the birth of a grandson and then Tuesday night here brother Ricky Berger will be here and he'll be talking about the song we saw the not be sure that you're here at 6 p.m. We'll have a great evening. We'll stay and eat, so sign up to bring food for that. And then Tuesday week begins where we add the VBS component to our Tuesday night gatherings. And so we want you to be here and our children to be here. We're excited to, to have this camping direction, Wilderness Wonders. You may see some decorations that, that Ryan and Brittany and others have, have worked so hard on already. And uh, we're, we're excited to spend that time with Jesus out of the wilderness, and we'll be able to to have a great, great, memorable summer because of it. And that first one, remember, is on July 4th. So please make your holiday plans with the church in mind. To be here at 6 on July the 4th, we'll have plenty of fun things after we dismiss from VBS too. We'll have inflatables, and we'll cook out, and we'll have homemade ice cream and fireworks. And so be sure that you're here for that great, great evening as we spend the summer together. There are two different voyages, expeditions around the turn of the 20th century that both got stuck, got caught in the ice off of Antarctica, two different ones. And they both got stuck leading up into the winter months. And with the winter months in Antarctica, around the South Pole, comes what they call the Antarctic night, which is the long course of those several months, it's complete darkness. The sun doesn't rise. You do occasionally have the moonlight providing some light. You have the aurora australis, which is the southern lights. But outside of those two sources of light, it's complete darkness around the clock, 24-7. And so the first of these groups was led by a Belgian man, Adrian de Gerlache. When the Antarctic night set in, they struggled even to eat on a regular basis. They did eventually develop a, a routine of walking around the ship to try to ward off some of the effects of insanity setting in. But even that became known with this nickname of the Madhouse Promenade. One man died of stress and anxiety, some sort of a, a heart condition. Two more men experienced crippling physical and emotional symptoms as a result of this extended time in terrifying darkness. Some 15 years later, that was 1898 and 1899, some 15 years later, 1914, Ernest Shackleton, an Irishman, led what he had planned to be the Trans-Antarctic Expedition, which was to, to sail to the coast and then hike he and his crew all the way across the continent. But before they could ever get to the coast, they got stuck in the ice. 
in the winter, and the darkness set in. But they had a much different response. Their ship was, interestingly enough, named the Endurance. Author Alfred Lansing says this about their experience during the Antarctic night. There was very little depression on board the Endurance. The coming of the polar night somehow drew them in closer together. It was remarkable that there were not more cases of friction among the men, especially after the Antarctic night set in. Instead of getting on each other's nerves, the entire party seemed to become more close-knit. The difference between the two parties essentially came down to their leader. Who were the men following? Shackleton had this healthy balance between letting them play games and organizing games and even pranks and competitions. They, would, they had these dogs that they were going to use to help them. They would race those dogs. They would compete and play sports, even in the pitch black dark. But they also had their hard work routines established. They never stopped working, even though they were stuck. So the principle is this, that peace is possible even in the midst of darkness. Not just inner peace, but also relational peace when we follow the right leader. Remember Jesus, as we've said, says in John 16 and verse 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. In the world you'll have darkness. In me you can have peace, even when that darkness sets in. So take heart because I have overcome the world. We're basing you know, our thoughts this morning off of kind of the trajectory we've already established, which is Jesus gives us all, as Christians, personal peace, but that also results in collective peace. He brings us together. We referenced this passage last week, but let's look at the kind of extended passage that it comes within. Ephesians 2, verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off, that's Gentiles, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. You see the nearness happening. A movement from away to near. For he himself is our peace. He has made us both one. So Jew and Gentile have been made one. He's broken down the, in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Hostility would kill us, and yet he kills hostility. And he came and preached, what? Preached peace to you Gentiles who were far off. And he came and he preached peace to Jews, those who were near. So the quick summary of this is that when we see the, the peace that Christ creates collectively, it's not merely just the absence of hurt feelings or the absence of notable conflict. It's the actual bringing together. We define peace as a, a la, or a existence of structure, dependability. Well, the bringing together ensures that that structure is implemented all throughout us as his people. So what follows is this. He gives us personal peace. He gives us collective peace. What happens when there's conflict? or misunderstanding, or difficulties that arise in our lives. And here's the result. We then seek Jesus, the source of our peace, in order to restore or deepen that peace with one another. Sometimes darkness will impact us such that we need to get back to seeking Jesus. And that's how we enjoy the peace he makes available to us. So exercising peace as church family, as Christians, looks like turning toward one another. And here's why it looks that way. It's because we're turning toward the same shepherd. We turn toward one another to deepen, restore our peace by turning toward the same shepherd. So when we're away from each other, but we decide we're going to turn toward the same shepherd, that automatically brings us closer to to each other. You see it again? When we're away from each other and we grow closer and draw nearer to Christ, 
it also has the effect of bringing us together. With that in mind, that principle in mind, listen to how Paul has addressed some things that happen for good in a church and in the church that is seeking its true shepherd, its good shepherd, Jesus Christ. That's where we turn our attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's begin in verse number 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So he's, as he's beginning to give them some very practical commands, he first says, remember who you're following. You follow the shepherds who are over you, knowing they follow the chief shepherd. And if we want a quick litmus test for our attitude toward following the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ, it is our attitude toward the earthly shepherds he's put into place in the church. Now here's why it's important we include verse 12 in this. These are separate commands that we're coming upon, but it's important we see that, that the path of peace, the things that make for peace, happen within an environment that understands the structure, that understands the leadership Jesus has put into place, which includes shepherds within the church. Here's the next phrase in verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. That's the last part of verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. So the healthy recognition for earthly shepherds, knowing they have plenty to do in, in terms of leading, that's their responsibility. Your responsibility is to then submit to them. Then we all collectively have the responsibility to be at peace amongst one another. And here's what's fascinating about the end of verse 13. It's one of the few times, four or five times in the whole New Testament, where peace is actually a verb. Almost always it's a noun. Occasionally, adjective or adverb. But here it's actually a verb. So we have to supply that helping verb. Be at peace. Experience peace. So be at peace amongst yourselves. There's a personal responsibility to collectively live in peace amongst one another. Let's keep going. Verse 14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. Be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. We look at these lists of characteristics. We would say these commands are ways in which a church that's truly following its good shepherd will carry out these things that make for peace. Let's talk quickly about that key phrase at the end of verse 13, be at peace amongst yourselves. It's a bridge between the two sections. You see verse number 12, how does it open? We ask you, brothers. You look at verse 14, how does it open? We urge you, brothers. So in between is this command, exercise peace. You've got a responsibility to your shepherds. You've also got a responsibility to each other. And the bridge is having an eye toward peace. How will you define your relationships? That's the question. When we see that command, be at peace amongst yourselves, it means for us to define all of our relationships within the church as a relationship of peace. Collectively, as a whole, I'm at peace. I'm experiencing peace. And then to the person, I'm at peace. This relationship with this person across the room or down the pew, that's one of peace. Now, just in terms to apply this on a mental level, that can be a challenge, can it? Where do we see it being the will of God, especially in keeping with this commandment, to say something along the lines of, I'm never entering the church building as long as so-and-so is there? He says, make peace among yourselves. Or to maybe be in the room with them, but to refuse to look at them or to talk to them. Where is that the will of God? You find the way, the way through Jesus to be at peace and to make peace with one another. But let's continue. The things that we need to implement on a more specific level. Verse number 14. We'll read it again. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. 
Notice carefully what he says at the beginning of verse 14. We urge you, brothers. These are not things only for the elders or shepherds to do. In order to be at peace with one another, all of the one another have a responsibility to one another. And so we're all going to have different seasons of life, or we're going to share those with different people. But when we are experiencing those with one another, we have responsibilities when certain threats arise. This should be a reminder. This responsibility that we all have to the collective peace, this should be a reminder that there is plenty of work to be done. There are plenty of people who need lifting up. There is plenty of pain among us that should keep us from complaining about why we don't have peace. Because there are plenty of people who need us to love them and to lift them up. Let's dive into these, implementing these things. We do need to ask, are these general categories or are they specific to the Thessalonians? I tend to think they're related to the context of the book as a whole. What are they experiencing? And now he's coming along and saying, here's what you need to, to address, how you need to address these things. So the first is this idea of being idle. And he says to admonish the idle. So I'm behind a slide. Um, these are crucial conversations for critical circumstances. We'll talk about why they're critical in just a moment. So the first is to admonish the idle. First, what's idleness? We might initially go to the thought of laziness. That's possible. It's got that aspect of the meaning. You see some of that coming to light at the end of, or the middle of chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 especially, that there is this growing tendency, probably some combination of their, their uncertainties and expectations about the return of Christ, as well as the growing influence of the emperor cult and, and kind of restrictions that happen because of that. They're just saying, hey, it'd be easier to not work. And since the church is so generous, they'll support me. And so he's saying there comes a point at where you not being responsible causes other people to have to be more responsible. So stop draining the overall resources of the church that needs to be serving the, those who are truly needy and those who are lost. Get back to doing what you know you need to do. And so he says, you be aware of this. This idleness is a very real threat. And listen carefully. You'll, you may notice there's like a footnote in the ESV that the idle can be translated as undisciplined. It's a lack of structure. What is peace? Peace is stability and structure and dependability. You flip over, you were to see, you know, in 2 Thessalonians, which was written shortly thereafter, 1 Thessalonians, he goes all in and talking about this busybody aspect. Same word, same concept. Which means they're busy, but not busy about the right things. They're active, but not active in the work of the Lord, active in spreading gossip and finding out what's happening in other people's lives instead of actively being a part on the level of the Lord. Anxious, but anxious about the wrong things. Caught up in things that just don't matter for eternity. Notice carefully what he says. For those who are idle, those who are stirring up and kicking about, the response that leads to peace is to admonish, to rebuke, to teach, to correct. If we're not careful, we might think that's an unpeaceful thing to do. Well, I can't, I can't call somebody out. I can't go to them and, and have a, a, a good conversation, a, a strong conversation, because that's not peaceful. This is actually a path of peace. And it's interesting. What is it that Jesus says when he's woken up from his nap on board the boat? The disciples are scared. Storm comes on. He's asleep. They wake him up. He wakes up. And he rebukes, he rebukes the wind. And he says to the sea, peace, be still. See, when we're given over to this idleness and this busybody anxiety, we're not at peace. And our actions are disrupting, threatening the peace of the church as a whole. And we need to be woken up. Calm. Find the calm that the shepherd Jesus provides. But then there's another category, he says. Encourage the faint-hearted. Encourage those whose souls, whose spirits have begun to shrunk. That's kind of the mental word picture involved in the word. Those who maybe don't have the same enthusiasm or courage for life that they should have and could have in Christ. When we're not actively living in the confidence God gives, we keep giving over more and more power to our worries 
to our cares and to our frets. And so the word for encourage, the response to those who are faint-hearted, is the simple word for comfort. You see it used by God multiple times. He is the comforter. You see it used, say, in an instance like Mary and Martha, John chapter 11. The Jews came to comfort them, to be a source by which they could express their grief and their loss. And so thinking about faint-heartedness in light of 1 Thessalonians, the persecution is increasing. That's a source of discouragement. But also we know that they've begun to, to experience deaths within the church. Loved ones, spouses and children and parents and siblings have died. And they are concerned that that has consequences as it relates to the return of Christ. Are they going to miss out on Christ returning? So they were grieving in multiple levels. They didn't understand the truth about the return of Christ. So that's why Paul had to include those truths. But there's this sense of discouragement. And notice what he says is the response to instill within them courage. To build them up. To hug them. To be a source of presence. To be a source of thoughtful listening. Isn't it important that we are close enough to one another to know the difference? And someone who's idle, who's being a busybody, who's kind of living an undisciplined life, as opposed to someone who's legitimately experiencing some losses and difficulties? What messes do we make if we wrongly admonish the faint-hearted? If we wrongly encourage the idle? So that's where this wisdom of following Jesus as our shepherd, being close enough to one another to be able to truly help, ends up being a big difference. All right, final category is to help the weak. You see a wide range of suggestions as to what weak means in this context. And both words, the verb help and the weak, those are just hard to translate fully into English. But I tend to think that the weak is a combination of any number of circumstances. You may have those who are in the first two categories. They kind of run this anxious life and yet it's wore them out and they're burnout. Especially that second category. The longer that discouragement and faint-heartedness grows over time the more crucial and urgent it gets. The picture behind weak is sick, sickness. I don't think that's all he has in mind, though. It could be those who are chronically sick, and that's led to an urgency in terms of a spiritual nature. It's possible it relates to the beginning verses of chapter 4, where he addresses how some of them are given into sexual temptation in the area. I think it's generally this concept that, that they're closest to falling out. They are urgently critical, need to be rescued. Because the verb for help is a very active verb. It means to grab onto, to hold onto. I think it's parallel to Jude chapter 23, or verse 23. You go into the fire to grab them out quickly. You don't compromise yourself, but you have to make some bold steps to help them because they're caught up in sin. Well, here it's not necessarily sin, but it's just knowing that as life compounds and losses compound we can get so weak that we need somebody to hold on to us think of the difference in someone who's injured or sick who can place their own arm around you and place their weight on you so that you they can help you help them you see it on a football field or sports field all the time right now compare that person with the person who's sick or injured and they have no strength left How much more difficult is that person to lift when they can't help you help them? I think that's the weakness that's in view. It's almost this limp spiritual situation. They were a part of the fold. They've worked their way out, perhaps even unintentionally. Circumstances have compounded. But now we collectively have the opportunity and the responsibility to hold on to, to grab hold on to one another as we draw nearer to our Savior. The final thing, though, combines them all because he says, be patient with them all or suffer long with them all. We won't do any of those three without patience, without true long-suffering. To correct, admonish those that we're closest to when they're idle, when they're busybodies, that takes patience. To build up and to walk with those who are faint-hearted, that takes patience, long-suffering. To really help those who are weak, who are struggling the most, that takes an incredible amount of patience. But remember, at the heart of all this is finding the peace that Jesus has made available to us. 
And going back in our minds to that text in Ephesians 2, what is it that brought Jew and Gentile together? What is it that brings us as Christians together? It's the blood of Christ. He suffered to make our peace available. He suffered to make peace in order for us to carry out and implement the things that make for peace. It will not come the easy way. It will not come by the way of least resistance. Instead, it comes by the way of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, who suffered in order to make that peace available. Now, the, the challenge of this text is not for us to go through and to try to put everybody in a bin, in a category. It's not a, a set of instructions that help us to judge one another. It should be a reminder of how quickly we could fall prey to being a busybody and being idle. Or to become overwhelmed with the losses of life and to become faint-hearted. To become weak if those situations in life are not addressed properly or if they extend and compound over long periods of time. It should provide within us sources of empathy first because we recognize just how difficult life can be. But it also should wake us up to this reality. He's telling us there is some mutual responsibility because it's not easy for us to see when we get caught up in these. It's not easy for us to see that we're busy bodies or idle. And so we need someone to wake us up. It's not easy to see when faint-heartedness kicks in or when our spiritual strength is zapped from us. So we need each other to exercise patience in order to implement these things because the temptation is real and difficult. The truth of all of this is the body is not fully at peace collectively when we as members are not fully at peace individually. When the body hurts or when a member hurts, the body hurts. And we should hurt with each other. And it's a text like this one that gives us a strategy and a way in which we can help one another and join in our pain to help us bring us to the one, the good shepherd, the true shepherd, Jesus Christ. This is the best way to, quote, go and fetch the lost sheep, is to keep us from becoming lost sheep. As we see one another moving toward the edges of the flock, as we see us slowing down, as we see us getting nearer the dangers beside us, those are the times to step in and to move ourselves and one another closer to our good shepherd. Quickly, two final things he mentions in the text. Verse 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil. We have to refuse revenge. We will not be at peace among ourselves as long as we leave the door open for revenge. I mentioned earlier that verse 13 of this text is one of the few times you see peace as a verb. There's another time that's probably more familiar to us in terms of like a quotable verse. It's in Romans chapter 12. It's verse 18. Listen to the context which, within which that verse comes. Romans 12, verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Verse 18, here's the piece as a verb. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Verse 19, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Verse 21, closing out that paragraph, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We put all that together, I think we see just how valuable verse 18 is. If possible, so much as it depends on you, you be at peace, you live at peace. What we must be careful about is using that verse as an excuse to do nothing. It has the exact opposite meaning. Do all that you can do, which is to pursue your Savior. That includes never returning evil for evil. Have we used maybe the, that verse or the principle behind the verse to kind of exercise the silent treatment? That doesn't lead to peace. Do we use that verse to, to say, well, I can't do anything because they're not willing? That's not exactly what Paul is meaning. Paul is saying, you do have only what you can do, but do all that you can do. And part of all of what you can do is to never do some things. Never respond to a negative with negative. Never repay evil for evil. The tipping point for peace will always be these moments when someone hurts us or there's a misunderstanding. How will we respond in those moments? 
Repaying evil for evil will never be the peacemaking response. Escalation never leads to peace. So as long as that possibility for negative reciprocal actions continues to be out on the table, as long as we think that that might happen in the back of our minds, we'll never fully trust one another in order to draw near to ourselves, to carry out the things that make for peace and to be at peace amongst ourselves. We're not following the good shepherd who refused revenge if we also fall prey to exacting revenge amongst one another. But the final thing, the end of verse 15, is to pursue interactions, to pursue treating one another in a way that's good and righteous. Pursue righteousness as it relates to our relationships. The peacemaker in the mold of God creates peace by doing good, not by doing harm. And the peacemaker from God exercises that response to every single person without partiality, without favoritism. Think of the word seek. It's seek in the ESV, but pursue, pursue after. What have we said about we as sheep and Jesus? What's Jesus said? We talked about it last week, John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So what happens when we all decide we're going to follow the same shepherd is we also decide to keep pursuing after that which is good toward each other and toward every one of each other. The mature, disciplined follower of Jesus is running after, seeking after, looking for constantly ways to do good and to be good to all brothers and sisters in Christ. Titanic was in the news this past week for unfortunate and tragic reasons. And so related to that, I heard a part of the Titanic story I either had forgotten or never heard. But once the Titanic struck the iceberg, there were survivors in the water and in lifeboats. And you may know that the Carpathia was about 60 miles away and it came to its rescue and all the survivors of the Titanic left the scene on the Carpathia. But at the same time of night, there was also another ship The SS Californian was closer, some 20 miles away. And its night crew heard the the fireworks exploding and they saw the flares. And they went and woke up the captain. His name was Stanley Lord. They woke him up and they said, hey, there's another ship that's firing off off the the, the flares. And he said, I'm sure someone's having a party tonight. And he rolled over and went to sleep. And they never checked the SOS messaging system. The captain had no desire to listen to the calls for help, potential calls for help, and so they never did and they never heard. Well, the reverse happened with the Carpathia. I don't think they even heard the flares, but they saw the SOS message come through. They changed their complete direction. They increased their speed. They burnt fuel that was extra. They they went faster really than they were supposed to. They navigated the risky icebergs to get to the side of the Titanic. They overfilled their capacity in order to save the lives that were in the ocean and in the lifeboats. Every survivor of the Titanic came home, came to the shores on board the Carpathia. So just a quick review. Zero survivors came home on the Californian because they didn't listen. When someone was in need. Every survivor The Titanic came home safely on the Carpathia because it listened when someone was in need. Proximity, closeness. Not every ship had this opportunity. So how do we implement the things that make for peace? It's got to come through proximity. Constant closeness and presence. But also listening. Listening honestly. And then knowing the things that make for peace. And truly following the shepherd even when... We have to have some of those crucial conversations that start from an empathy and a listening the times we need it the most. If you need to come to know the Good Shepherd this morning, this time is for you. Would you obey him? Put him on in baptism where he promises to forgive and to save and to add you to his church, his flock. If you know that you've left his side, you've been a sheep that's wandered astray and you need to come back to the Good Shepherd, we're here as your church family to be here for you and with you however we can. 
please know that we love you and the Lord loves you. Come now.